Welcome to your next great novel. This is your host, Phil Williams. Today I'm with my lovely co-host, Denise, and we'll be discussing my new release, 2050, Psycho Island, book one. How are you doing, Denise? Very well, considering the coronavirus outbreak. How about you? Uh, doing well, all things considered. So let's talk about 2050, Psycho Island. Okay. The story begins, obviously, in 2050. So in in 2050, the American dream is a mirage. The gap between the haves and the have-nots is wider than ever before. The haves live a life of opulence with robotic domestics and self-driving vehicles. The have-nots struggle to survive. Their jobs long since replaced by automation, with only universal basic income standing between them and starvation. Crime is nearly non-existent, thanks to the surveillance state and the test. Cameras and facial recognition software deter and detect would-be criminals, and the test identifies psychopaths with 99.59% accuracy. Citizens who test positive receive a one-way ticket to U.S. Penal Colony East. The have-nots call it Psycho Island. In 2050, people struggle for their piece of a shrinking pie. Derek Reeves is one of those people, a small farmer, his business hanging by a thread. His wife, Rebecca, dreams of the finer things in life. Jacob Roth, CEO and member of the most powerful banking family in the world, sweeps Rebecca off her feet and gives her the lifestyle she craves. Summer Fitzgerald's pregnant. Like all prospective parents, she wants a designer baby. These children vastly outperform natural-born children. Unfortunately, her nurse's salary and her fiancé's low-level tech job don't pay enough to give their little bundle of joy the must-have advantage in the new economy. Naomi Sutton is a congresswoman with her eye on the White House unwilling to take campaign donations with strings. She lacks the budget or the connections for a serious run at the presidency. In a town of sharks, she's the only one who truly cares about the people. Will she compromise her ideals to sit on the throne of power? Will she make good on her promise to close Psycho Island? In 2050, the seeds of discontent are growing. The elites will stop at nothing to maintain their, do their dominance. But the people are awakening to the rigged game, and they're very very angry. Small disclaimer here, this novel contains adult content, language, and sexual situations. So for those of you that need that trigger warning, this book's definitely not for you. Or for those of you who like it, all right. Okay, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Denise was the first person to read 2050, Psycho Island. So what did you think of the story? I think it is a wonderful story that demonstrates what life could be like in the future. I think back to the first six or seven chapters, they show how life is like for the poor, middle class, and the wealthy in the future. Not only is there so much less work for the rich because of robotic technology that only the rich can afford, but in 2050, the wealthy can even birth, in air quotes, better children because of the advancement in genetics. These children are extraordinarily intelligent, fantastic athletes, this really tugs at my sense of justice and belief in a growth mindset. I find comfort in those who work hard, persevere, and have, and have a fantastic attitude that they will be the most successful and the happiest in society. I know that there are many who have so many more advantages than others, but I feel like at least currently there's a chance for anyone to be successful and happy. But with the genetic advancements, I wonder if the chance is gone now this is one of the only many fascinating facets in the book. Like your other books, I read this in record time. Your knack for dialogue is incredible. It's never contrived. It's so real. I think, of course, you'd make a fantastic screenwriter. Thank you. It's You're really welcome. nice of you to say. Another thing that I found interesting is how the character arcs weave around each other. I love this in books and movies. Can you explain how the plot was devised and structured? The way the plot is structured, there's four main characters, so and I sort of gave you the characters when I was uh, reading the description, but so there's Derek, there's Summer, there's Naomi, and then there's uh, Jacob. So you have these four main characters, and basically each chapter is from the perspective of that, of one of the characters. And they actually follow a very perfect structure. So... I forget who's chapter one. I think it's Derek. It's Derek. Okay, so Derek is one, and then followed by uh, Summer, maybe. 
think it's Derek, Summer, Jacob, and then Naomi. I think so. And then what ends up and then what ends up happening is that same cycle repeats itself. So one through four is those four characters in that order. Five through eight is the same thing. Those same characters will continue on with the story. And then as the as the story is being told, the plots start to wrap around each other. The characters start to interact. And you'll start to see things happen where one character does one thing and then you see the effect on another or multiple characters. And, and so you really start to interact with the plot in that way. So the longer you read the series, the more you see the effects of, of certain points of view and certain characters on the others and vice versa. And it's incredibly complex, though. It's not easy at all to do and, and to pull off in, in a way that I think makes sense to people because one of the big problems is, is that there's a timeline that has to be followed. So every single chapter, I don't, I don't list the date in the book and the time, but on my outline, there's actually a date and a time for every single chapter. And it has to coincide to where I'm not going back and forth in time because it gets, in my opinion, it gets to be too confusing for the readers. So not only does the plot have to wrap, wrap around the characters, but, and you have to tell a, a coherent story, but it has to happen in the proper time frame. So that must be a lot of pieces that you have to keep in mind at all times, like a lot of balls you have to juggle yes. as you're writing. Oh, you're absolutely right. That's the big thing. And sometimes my editor will say, well, you didn't finish that piece of the plot. What happened with this and what happened with that? You know, sometimes she says that and it's like, well, that hasn't been fit. We're getting to that. You know, hold your horses. Relax. Right. Hold your horses. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, but it's something that you have to. 1985. Right. Hold your horses. Yeah. <laughs> you have to remember all the different balls that you've got in the air and make. Because if you wait too long to resolve some of these things, people start to forget about that particular subplot. And I mean, there's just so much to right. it that you know you want to put all the pieces together and whatnot. So, and there's and there's a fair amount of characters. And so, how do you keep track of everything? Uh, a massive spreadsheet and a big plot outline and. We have, of course, you know, you just you just started looking at the. Well, you can tell the people what's on the walls. Well, if you didn't know Phil, you might think he's a mass murderer. There's pictures of probably about fifty people taped together with uh, transparent tape, scotch tape, on his wall, and they have pictures and descriptions and all sorts of interesting things that he. It's probably like, close to a hundred. Maybe there is more of a hundred here. I didn't actually count any, but I don't know. I was just I was looking right in front of me and maybe 80, uh, maybe 80. but uh, he'll have things like uh, the funniest ones I think are when he has the babies because he'll have like occupation for each one and he'll have um, the occupation of a baby is being a baby <laughs> which I don't know for me that always strikes me as really funny but uh, so there's uh, all these different characters and like what he thinks they look like in his head and what they do and sort of like their base personality and they're well, all it's not what, the, what they look like in my head there's actually a real picture right there's a real picture but I mean like the picture comes from what you think that they would look like right That's so what I mean. so I, what i do is if it, if if i'm like okay i want a middle-aged man uh, I'll, I'll type in middle-aged man into google I'll go to Google Images and just scroll through there, and I'm like, oh, that guy looks like the guy that's in my head for that particular character, and then I'll just copy that and put it on the piece of paper and, you know, along with the character profile. So the character profiles have everything from their name, their age, occupation, height and weight, their physical description, you know, specifics, so that way I'm, I'm consistent throughout the manuscript. And then also their mental description, temperament, background, you know, what their history is like. Uh, you know, how they talk, their tics and idiosyncrasies, you know, what they really want out of life. Uh, so the idea is that when I have to put these two characters in a room to do whatever it is that they're going to do, whether they're going to have an argument, whether they're going to talk, whether they're going to fight, whatever it is, I know what that person would probably say and how they would probably act based on their background, based on how they would talk, all the whole thing. So it, it Hopefully, gives it more of a more of a realism right. to people, you know, when they when they actually when to the reader when they when they encounter the manuscript. But. Right. When anybody comes in here, they always I find myself reading them all, reading all the descriptions, looking at all the pictures, and if we have friends or anything over, they they do the same. It's actually quite interesting and fascinating how he does it. In my opinion, twenty fifty Psycho Island is more of a dystopian story than science fiction, even though it does take place. In 2050, there are future technologies. 
but much of the story takes place on a primitive island prison. And, you know, 2050 is only 30 years from now, so my vision of the future isn't, it's not too crazy, but I, I highly doubt that we're going to have an island prison. I mean, this was, I, I don't think that that's a likely scenario. However, it, it was something that I think is, was interesting for the story. And it was a, it was an interesting way to tell the story, and there's a you know there's a deeper meaning to the to the I, island. And it's a it's a very interesting premise. Like, what if we what if we did have that? What if that test did exist, and this is what really would happen? Right, exactly. However, there are plenty of things in the series that are things that I think are likely to happen. Of the future events and technologies in Psycho Island, which which do you think are? What are a few that you think are likely to happen? Well, the likely things. Um, I think uh, learning is going to be like education and learning is going to be more and more done online and through different facets of technology. So, so in reference to that, the, the kids, the, the two boys that live down the street at the apartment building from right. Derek, they reference how they, you know, go Derek, to school. Yeah, how they go to school online. Quote unquote, go to school. Yeah. Right. And De- Derek kind of gets on them because they're at their, they're at the orchard and they're kind of like stealing his, his fruit. Right. And he gets on still in the and, oranges. He, and he's like, you know, why, why aren't you in school? You know, what are you doing out here? Basically? They're like, don't you know anything? We do everything online. He's yeah. like, well, then shouldn't you be in front of a computer? And, uh, and there's like, we do it at night because the internet cheaper that way. The internet is cheaper that way because these are, these are uh, more of the poor kids. Right. So, I, so that's uh, the online learning that you see in the. Right. 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 I'm sorry, I interrupted. So no, I that's okay. Um, interesting though, I think in some ways things might actually become more primitive like the actual island now with the COVID-19 ramifications people are encouraged to stay at home and supply chain and supply chains are disruptive so one positive yet primitive action is to plant a garden a lot of people are recommending that even hearing that from different folks and uh and you know and people may be forced to be more self-sufficient like those in primitive cultures be able to take better care of themselves both physically and emotionally this could be very scary and probably will be very scary uh, and painful an experience for many but it can also be very enlightening and fulfilling depending on how you choose to handle it now, the experience you're talking about is dealing with the cervasive sickness Right, it's amazing. It's sickness, what yeah. George, that's what George. I don't know if anybody knows who George Gammon is. I, I like him. If you go on YouTube and type in his name, he he basically does a bunch of financial whiteboard explanations, which actually is is really good for me because I write a lot of financial. There's a lot of financial stuff in my books, and he explains exactly how a lot of this stuff works in a kind of a whiteboard format. Anyway, he calls it the cerveza sickness because he doesn't want to get demonetized on YouTube for <laughs> using COVID-19. But uh, anyway, so that's what you're referencing. Right, that- I'm referencing like the, uh, you know, the current event of today and how we're already being very much affected by it. I mean, I've been out of, I'm a teacher and I've been out of work for, I mean, well, not school, not not actually out of work, but out of session for a week now. Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a big deal for people that are obviously not working and not lucky enough to have a job that still pays them even when they're not at work. Right. I am lucky enough to have that and lucky enough to live in a house where I have my own gym and have six acres of property and live less than a mile away from a store that we can go very late and not be around people and all those, all that, you know, positive things that we have going for us for right now, thankfully. And a a nice garden with a bunch of fruit trees and Right. Chickens running around and right and eggs coming in and, and bees. obviously we don't have the harvest quite yet but that's coming soon. So enough with that, like you said. Uh, so what do you think is likely to happen in 2050? I did a ton of research for this book series and I started in very early 2019, like February 2019, and I, so I did about eight nine months of of very hardcore research before I started writing the writing the book series and this book has taken this series and book has taken much longer than anything else you've ever written yeah it has been really very time consuming but uh it's coming along faster now because i have all the plot everything's done with the plot it's just a matter of writing the 
you know, writing the chapters and I already know what's going to happen for the most part. So it's just a matter of, of getting it down now, but all the research is done and all that, all the, all the prep work. So it's going a little faster now, but initially getting out the first book took me a year. I've never taken a year to get a single book. So that to give you some idea of how long that took, but now it's, now I'm speeding up and I'm trying to get each subsequent book out every three months or every four months. I'm sorry, not three months, but so I did a ton of research and one of the things that I put in the book was a currency crisis and a major economic crisis starting in 2020 and leading to a greater depression throughout the 2020s. That was sort of the, the setup for that's what's in the book. And I and unfortunately, I think I'm being proven possibly correct based on what's what's going on. Right. Which what's is, happening now, which, you know, I, I would rather not be correct on this. <laughs> but um, but that does seem to be one thing that I thought was going to happen that happened a lot faster than I could even get the books out. And um, I didn't know that we would have the pandemic, of course, but the over-leveraged, the everything bubble, the stock, stocks, bonds, real estate, even art and collectibles, everything was outrageously priced, overvalued, in a bubble, uh, not to mention the, the record amounts of uh, margin debt, the records amounts of, of debt, uh, debt to GDP ratios were all over the, were way out of whack. Um, so, so the whole thing was a, it was a, a massive bubble in search of a pen. And of course the pandemic was the pen, but it was, it ended up being more like a sledgehammer destroying the bubbles. But I think we, this would have happened anyway, at some point it could have been any catalyst could have done what's, what, what the virus is doing. So it's just, the virus is just a, a unbelievably bad one. I, right. I, I couldn't think of a worse black swan to come along and, and pop the bubble. I would have hoped it would have been something that would have given us, given us a softer landing. But anyway. And not I, attack people from so many angles. Right. And again, we, we're not supposed to talk about it. So right. <laughs> we're not supposed to talk about it. So I'm breaking, breaking my own rules. But anyway, I think that self-driving vehicles are a lock. I would that, love that. That'd be awesome. I know. You keep talking. You want it because you don't I, like to drive. I don't like to drive. So I would love a self-driving yeah. car. And that was an easy prediction to make because they already have them. They already have them. And eventually they'll, it, they'll the technology will get better and better. And I think eventually it's, it's going to be a normal yeah. thing. I don't even have a long commute to work or anything. But people that do, that'd be awesome. You could start as soon as you get in the car. Well, you, you need a self-driving vehicle to work. Because Denise, like, I make Denise eggs in the morning for, for <laughs> breakfast, right? And by the way, I've gotten a ton of mileage out of this. Like, everybody thinks I'm the best husband ever. Just they because, do. Just because I make her eggs. And it takes me literally, I've been making eggs for myself too, by the way. So I It's st- just scrambled eggs, by the way. Right. It's not, it's not super special, but. And fruit. You do make me fruit and tea. That's true. And tea. Although you sort of, you Set sort of up. like, yeah, you sort of put that in there one day. But anyway, I snuck that in there. Yeah, you added that to my my <laughs> regimen every day. But so I spent an extra, you know, five to ten minutes on Denise's breakfast. But yet, all of a sudden, I'm like the best husband in the world. And then Denise comes home and makes this extravagant dinner from scratch. But she doesn't, every night. But she doesn't Pretty get much. much credit from that. So th- there's still some sexism going on. Right. I told my friends who pride themselves on not being sexist and they're like oh my gosh that's so nice that's so awesome oh my gosh and i'm just like you know you guys are so sexist they're like what do you mean i'm like i go home every night and make dinner from scratch i'm like i love that phil does this like it's fantastic and they're just like look at me i'm just like oh my god (laughs) yeah so denise needs a self-driving vehicle because i I make her i make her eggs and i have to put it in this container (laughs) <laughs> because she pushes like the limit of being late every day down to like literally like a, a fraction of a second. I have three minutes to spare, typically. Yeah, three minutes. <laughs> exactly. So that's my point. So she barely makes it to work every day on time. Barely. And she's she eats her eggs in the car on the way to work, driving a stick, mind you. Uh, and she eats her eggs with her hands. <laughs> so I, mean, it's, I don't even know how that even happens but somehow denise makes it work where she eats her eggs in the morning for breakfast with her hands and the and the fruit that you cut yeah and the fruit which i can i have a napkin easier. i have a napkin okay well and i drink i drink water i drink the tea when i'm at work it would be a lot nicer if you could sit back and let the car drive you while oh, you yeah. ate your breakfast and actually have a utensil yeah and have a utensil and you could eat like a normal human being yes right okay so anyway so that's so self-driving vehicles i think are a lock that's a positive yeah so that'll be nice fortunately i think that there'll be a shortage of uh, employment because if you think about 
trucking, for example, is the number one job in America is basically being a driver. So by so if driving is automated, those all those jobs go away. It's very scary. Yeah, it's it's a, it's unfortunate for people that are driving truck. And I think our government, unfortunately, I think our government continues to be more and more invasive and oppressive. That's not a difficult prediction to make because if you look throughout history, that's what they've done. That's what right. the U.S. government and just about every other government on the planet has done is as time goes on, they take more and more power and more and more money and more and more rights away from their citizens. And every year we get more and more rules and laws that we have to follow, uh, more and more taxes, and they never take these things away. So it's not it's not a difficult prediction to make that we're going to have a more invasive and oppressive system. So more rules for us to follow, more penalties when we break the rules. Also more surveillance. I think that's a definite trend and that's an easy easy prediction to make is more surveillance, more facial recognition cameras. Which you do mention in the book. Yeah, so that's a big piece of the book is the uh, the facial recognition cameras and obviously the self-driving vehicles that's in mm-hmm. the book. I think we'll have designer babies. I think that that's a big piece of the book and I think that's coming to where parents can go to a uh, or a clinic. I don't know how they'll do it exactly, but they can choose traits for their children. That's a really hard one for me to swallow. Yeah, so I, th- I think that's coming, and they've already started doing some of this stuff. And I think in, in China, they're, basically it's mostly been around uh, disease, disease prevention. Disease control, yeah, yeah disease, disease prevention, prevention. Which, is, which is wonderful. and Which sounds great, right. but the, the next step, of course, after disease prevention is like, hey, I don't want... I don't want my son to be short. Let's make him taller. Hey, I don't want. I don't right. want. I want my. I, mean, what was I want my kid to be cute. So designer babies, yes, smaller, taller, disease resistant, whatever. It's they're gonna. Maybe people are gonna do it. I think there will be a bigger gap between the rich and poor. That's an, uh, also another easy prediction to make because that's that's a trend that that doesn't seem to be stopping. Uh, AI, AI robotics and robot domestics. That's I think that's coming. Uh, they've already got the technology to do a lot of this stuff. It's just a matter of uh, perfecting it and and commercializing it. And but I think that it's not going to be a Jetson society where we all have this stuff, right? I I think right. that it's really going to be a lot of this stuff is only going to be for the very wealthy of our society, unfortunately. So if you're expecting your own personal robot slave, you probably you and me probably aren't going to have one. So. So don't don't think that you're getting one. <laughs> yeah, having more free time and having more time to to explore different things and explore different interests that you know many people may have not the time now is great. But at the same time, it's it's like don't you think it's somewhat disturbing to not know how to do things? Yeah, I think it is important that we can do things for ourselves without some machine or without having to always call a guy. So Great call uh, a guy. yeah, anyway, I, I could go on a, a long rant about that, but we, let's, let's move on. <laughs> I think we'll face some serious environmental calamities and that stuff is, and again, that's easy to predict too, because the trends are already there. Erosion of topsoil, uh, because that's of un- already there because of unsustainable farming practices. The number one export in the United States by weight is topsoil blowing off the farmlands into the Mississippi. So that's crazy. Yeah, no, it is crazy. Uh, shortage of phosphorus. That's our. That's I think that's going to be a big issue uh, with the with the chemical fertilizers. Shortages of certain strategic metals. I think that's coming, and that's in the book. Uh, further acidification of the oceans, which is already a major issue, and that's why we have so many jellyfish now. Uh, continued insect. Go to the and, Chesapeake. Yeah, continued insect and pollinator decline. That's a big issue. Although you wouldn't know it here, we have no. We have tons of bees, which is fantastic, and yeah. they're so sweet. Yeah. Well, we we've. I'd like to think that we've created an environment that, you know, all these things are, you know, finding their niches, right? Right. Like I saw a snake today. Was, Just hanging out. Yeah, it was nice to see. Clean fresh water shortages. I think that's going to be a problem, which it already is. Is uh, there, I mean, there's tons of water on the earth, no doubt about that. But the places cl- that are more arid. Yeah, I mean, in general, the the, I mean, most of the earth is water, but clean fresh water is the problem, and there's there, and that's becoming more and more of a problem. And again, this is something that's already happening, but I think it'll get worse. And these are some of the the future tw- trends that you know I wove into the storyline of 2050. Oh, uh, it's very frightening, and 
I, you know, I hope we're, you're, <laughs> you're wrong and things can be better. Yeah. So do I. I hope it's just, just good fiction for people to enjoy. <laughs> right. Let's hope. Yeah. So Psycho Island is, of course, as we just said, fiction. So what is, what's the biggest thing in the book that you think is unlikely to happen? Right. So I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier. I think definitely the island prison. So in the story, hurricanes have devastated the Caribbean and Puerto Rico was abandoned and turned into this open air prison for essentially for psychopaths. So anyone that's arrested in the story is given a test to determine psychopathy. And if you test positive, the prison system ships you off to the island prison. Uh, essentially, if you're on the east, if you're east of the Mississippi, they send you to basically Puerto Rico, which is the open air island prison on the east coast, or Hawaii if you're west of the Mississippi. Obviously, I don't think that this is a likely scenario at all, but uh, a primitive tropical island full of psychopaths made for an interesting setting for the story. So, absolutely. So absolutely. We even the, discussed that before you even wrote the book. We thought it would be an interesting premise. Right. And it's just like, hey, what would it be like if we put you know, an island full of psychopaths and, and no power, no food, nothing, just throw them on there and see what they... And right. just I think it no. was derived because I was really upset with somebody and I and I said that one day and I said, what if there was just an island you just put them on? And you're like, ooh. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. Was there a particular character that you resonated with or one that you particularly hated? Uh, I'll go with the one I resonated with. I'm trying to be positive. And so uh, the character that I resonated the most with was Der is Derek, which is a little weird since he's a male character, but he reminds me of you, so I felt closer to him. And in the book, he is dismissed when he's very right about things, and I definitely know what that feels like. Is he? I, I'm trying to think. Is he really dismissed when he's right about things? Well, I think that in the part where he talks with his daughter and his daughter doesn't is really dismissive of his feelings of oh, being right. his, yeah, I of guess being that's his true. father. That's true. And I, didn't uh, I forgot about that part. So I picked a scene from 2050 Psycho Island to read aloud. This is a breakfast scene of Jacob, who Jacob is from this wealthy banking family and his family lives a much more luxurious lifestyle than, than, than Derek, who's a farmer, or Summer, who's a nurse. I also think you do a nice job in showing that, showing what it looks like to be Derek in his situation, Summer in her situation, Jacob and Rebecca in their situ and how they live, as well as Naomi. And I think you do a good job of describing that so you can really see and feel how different, what different people's lifestyles are. Right, and everybody has a point of view. Even the people that are antagonists, they don't believe nobody, and I don't think anybody really believes that they're the antagonist. Like everybody thinks they're the hero in their own life, right? Nobody, sure. nobody goes yeah. around and says I'm the bad person, you know, unless yeah. unless they do it, as, unless they unless they're trying to own it, being like, you know, I'm like I'm a badass, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, but most people, and really, that just means you're an immature ass, right? Right, <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> but most people think that they're the hero in the story they're the hero in the life and in, the, in their life and nobody envisions when they're identifying with uh, a movie or a story they're always identifying with the hero in the story because they think they would be like the hero but a lot of people wouldn't be like the hero a lot of people would do the wrong thing a lot of people wouldn't be that courageous a lot of people wouldn't a lot of people would be the nazis though they think they wouldn't be yeah because you'd be propagandized some of my characters that are the heroes i write them how i would want to be but I don't know for a fact that's how I would be in that situation. Right. I would like to think it. That would be how I'd want to be. But I don't know. I would probably be afraid. Yeah. Right? I would probably be. I think you would like to be that way. And I think that you do a nice job many times of encouraging others to be that way. Right. So so anyway, so I think it's interesting how every person wants to, would be the hero in their mind. And I try to write the antagonist the same way. So... The antagonists have their own set of people that believe in them. They believe in themselves. They believe in what they're doing. You know, they're not, even if they're evil, they don't see it that way. So, I mean, they have their own perspective and point of view. It's not just these cardboard cutouts of, you know, it's Darth Vader or something. Right. I guess Darth Vader is a little more rounded, right? <laughs> because he wasn't totally evil. But right. anyway, that was a bad example. But <laughs> anyway, so... I picked this scene, and it's, again, it's J Jacob, and he's the wealthy banker, and it's basically an introduction to his uh, family at the breakfast table. So we'll, let's go ahead and 
read out the scene. Denise is going to okay. play the Denise will play the female characters, and I will play the narrator and the male characters. Okay. All right. Ready? Yep. Chapter two: Jacob and his enhanced family. The Roths tapped on their tablets as the robot served them breakfast. The dining room table was covered in white linen, a chandelier overhead, antique and ornate plates, plates on display in the nearby china cabinet. Jacob and Rebecca had smoked salmon and eggs, Benedict, and roasted potatoes with chicory and hollandaise sauce. Their boys, David and Ethan, had buttermilk pancakes, bacon, and organic apples. Their eldest child, teenager Lindsay, also had, had pancakes, but hers were chocolate chip with cinnamon and whipped cream. Hey, no fair, David said, scowling at his sister's breakfast. Why does she get whipped cream? And chocolate chips. You need to learn to code. Lindsay grinned at David and took a bite of her pancakes. I do know how to code, David said to Lindsay. Better than you, stock girl. He said stock girl under his breath. Sorry, I didn't do that under my breath. <laughs> but who has chocolate chip cam- pancakes and who doesn't? All the pancakes are good, said Ethan, the youngest. He looked up at the robot and said, thank you for breakfast, Jeeves. You're welcome, Master Ethan, Jeeves replied. Sorry for the voice. <laughs> Make me chocolate, champ- chocolate chip pancakes now, David said to the bot. Right away, Master David. The five foot six robot was shaped like a human with arms and legs and a head roughly proportional to a human being. His aluminum and titanium frame was covered in white and blue plastic, making him look softer and more toy-like. Six years ago, when Jacob had purchased the household bot for Rebecca, the bot's demeanor and British accent had been chosen by Lindsay. Rebecca looked up from her tablet. No, Jeeves, don't spoil him. Nothing is wrong with the breakfast he has. David crossed his arms over his chest, his face reddening. The six-year-old had straight dark hair parted to the side, dark eyes, and a gap where his bottom front baby teeth had fallen out. That's not spoiling me. Pancakes cost like one fed coin. It's not about the money. Do you want me to have a bad day? This isn't a debate. I want chocolate chip pancakes. David smacked the sides of his fists on the table. That's enough, Jacob said, glaring at David. Rebecca took a deep breath, closing her eyes for a moment. Jeeves isn't making you another breakfast. That's final. David huffed and pouted, his lower lip protruding. Jacob held out his coffee cup, never lifting his eyes from his tablet. More coffee. Right away, sir, Jeeves said, taking his cup and walking to the kitchen. Rebecca turned to her daughter. Don't forget, you're at your dad's this weekend. Lindsay set down her fork with a clang. Do I have to go? You missed last time. But the farm is so boring, and I want to go to this VR party. I'm sure your dad will be fine with you going to the party. (sighs) His internet is too slow for VR. Well, I'll talk to him. We'll see what he says. What about the adoption? Lindsay asked. Once I'm adopted, I don't have to go, right? With that... Jacob looked up from his tablet, chewing his food. He hasn't agreed to that yet, Rebecca said. Have you even asked him? Lindsay replied. Not yet, but I will. He will want to talk to you about it, though. Lindsay's eyes widened. But he'll be upset. He'll understand, Jacob interjected. It's for the best. He'll see that. (sighs) One step at a time. I'll talk to him this week, Rebecca said. About the weekend and the adoption? Lindsay asked. Yes. David giggled and said in a sing-song voice, Lindsay's not a Roth. Lindsay's not a Roth. Lindsay's already a Roth, Jacob said, cutting off David's song. This is just a formality. Lindsay smiled at her stepfather, sitting across the table. Rebecca turned to Jacob and mouthed, I love you. Jacob placed his hand atop his wife's and squeezed. Rebecca was in her late 30s, but she looked 10 years younger, no doubt improved by modern cosmetic surgeries. She was naturally pretty with high cheekbones and bright brown eyes, but she was made flawless by science. Unwanted fat cells were killed by nanolipo, a technique that injected gold nanoparticles into problem areas. The fat then melted by a laser. Other lasers were used to smooth and to tighten her skin, to remove unwanted veins and stretch marks, and to heal sun damage. Without invasive surgery, she stayed young, at least in appearance. Grandpa doesn't think Lindsay's a Roth. David said with a crooked smirk. Yes, he does, Rebecca replied. Who told you that? You did, David paused for a beat. 
because you said Lindsay has a different dad. Not another word, Jacob said, pointing his knife across the table at David. Word? Jacob shook his head, looking at, looking at Rebecca. I don't know how you do it. Without Jeeves, I'm not sure I could. I love you, Ethan said to his half-sister. I don't care if you get adopted. Thanks, Peanut, Lindsay replied. That was so sweet, Ethan, Rebecca said. Five-year-old Ethan beamed at his mother's approval. Like his brother, he looked like he could be a child actor, with his light brown hair and big brown eyes like his mother, whereas David had jet black hair and dark eyes like his father. Last night on MeTube, I saw this awesome video about a dog just like Spike, David announced, jockeying for the spotlight. He tapped on his screen. Look, it's so cool. David handed his tablet to Lindsay. Lindsay played the video, holding it up so everyone could see. Jeeves entered the dining room and set Jacob's cup of coffee in front of him. Then he stood at attention in the back corner of the room, awaiting instruction. The video footage showed a man breaking a window from the outside and attempting to enter a nicely furnished home. The robotic dog, outfitted with a, ro- with a rotating rifle on its back, shot the man in the head. Lindsay stopped the video. That wasn't very appetizing. I don't want you watching that violence. I could have Jeeves, sus- Jeeves suspend your access to the internet, Rebecca said. But he was a bad man, David said. Wouldn't it be better if the dog just called the police or used a taser? Rebecca asked. What if that was the owner of the house? What if he was locked out? David shook his head. That was a bad man. He had on a mask. All the bots know faces anyway. He was probably a murderer. Where do you learn these things? It's normal for enhanced kids, Jacob whispered to Rebecca. Mayor's kids did the same thing. They just grow up faster. I know, but he's only six, Rebecca whispered back. David gulped his milk. Can we put a gun on Spike? We are not putting a gun on Spike, Rebecca said. I could program Spike to bite their junk, Lindsay said. (laughs) The boys howled, milk shooting from David's nose. Rebecca laughed, too. We're not doing that either. Jacob stood up from the table and held out his coffee cup. Put this in a travel mug. The bot approached Jacob, took the cup, and responded, Right away, sir. You're leaving already? Rebecca asked. I'd rather stay home but I have a ton to do before the Bilderberg meeting on Friday, Jacob said. Is that this week? Afraid so. You're invited this year? Jacob stiffened. Dad wants me there for the after meetings. It's a waste of your time, Rebecca replied. Maybe. I'm hoping to secure financing while I'm there. That's it for chapter two. I apologize to the listeners because we are not professional voice actor <laughs> so uh i have renewed appreciation for my for to my the people voice who do actor, it professionally from a, for the voice actors that do my books right like, they're very good they're way way better than than me for sure like I, I can't even keep the voices straight so that's it for chapter two normally we rate books but i won't ask i'm not gonna ask denise to rate this one but i would do want to ask you how would you rate this book compared to my others because denise has read every single one Well, I think the writing in this book is the best out of all of them. I also like how the plot and characters are more complicated and there's a lot more surprises. So even though there is more financial and political pieces that I don't always gravitate to, I do think this book is extreme is much more complex and much and and, uh, much better written than than when you began with. Great. Well, thank you. It's really nice of you to say. I think. The one, the one thing that I worry about is there are a lot of characters, and I know that's a problem. And I, but I, if you get the characters, especially from the first book, if you because there's not a lot of new characters. I mean, there are new characters in each successive book, but the first one's the worst because there's a lot of because it's all being introduced. Right. But once you get past the first book. There's not near as many new characters being introduced, and they all kind of build on each other. So that's something to bear in mind if you're if you're planning to read the book. Is that once you understand who the characters are, and you can keep them straight, the successive books just kind of build on that. So anyway, right? I don't. I I really don't think that was a huge problem. I was able to keep things straight, and I'm someone who 
watched Game of Thrones and there was times where I was like, now who's this person? Now what's his name? And right. what's it's going not, on? I, I mean, don't it's, think it's, it's quite <laughs> as bad as Game of Thrones. No, but. it's not. It's not like that. I didn't have any, and that's even watching it with the characters right in front of you. Right. Uh, so I, it's definitely uh, not as many characters as, as that. So I didn't find myself getting lost and thinking, well, who's that? Let me go back and read. I'm not sure who that is. All right, well, thank you so much, Denise. Sure. That's it for today. Thank you for listening to another episode of your next great novel. Be sure to subscribe. You can find the podcast at philwbooks.com and on iTunes, Stitcher, or TuneIn. 